Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll look at a new report that focuses on improvement efforts in West Phoenix. And we'll hear from the Arizona Commerce Authority about efforts to expand business opportunities around the state. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. State lawmakers revived a number of controversial election law changes today. The changes include dropping voters from early voting lists if they fail to vote by mail in consecutive elections. Other provisions involve tightening the petition gathering process for citizen initiatives and putting limits on those who return another voter's ballot to the polls. The changes were all bundled into one bill that was forwarded for a final vote after a brief conference committee meeting. Critics of the bill say the changes restrict voting rights. The West Phoenix Revitalization Area 2012 annual report is out and shows encouraging results on efforts to improve West Phoenix. Ginger Spencer, special assistant to the Phoenix City Manager, is here to talk about the report, as is Jim Miller, chair of the West Phoenix Revitalization Area Board. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining Good us. To be here. Uh, give me a better definition here. What is the West Phoenix Revitalization Area? Yes, the West Phoenix Revitalization Area is basically a 52 square mile area in West Phoenix. It spans from Van Buren on the southern end to Dunlap, Camelback to the north, and then from 19th Avenue all the way out to the Loop 101. So basically that's the area that we're talking about for West Phoenix Revitalization. And, and the West Phoenix Revitalization Area, is it a group, is it an organization, how, do, how is it constructed? Yes, yeah, so it's the West Phoenix Revitalization Advisory Board and it was appointed by the Mayor and Council back in 2006 and Jim Miller is our current chairman. And, so, and, so let's talk mm -hmm. to Jim here, how does the Community Advisory Board work here, what, what's involved? It's, it's made up of about 16 uh, citizens. Either they live or work in the West Phoenix area. Uh, we've got a diverse group from, from neighborhood activists, uh, block watch leaders, to business people like myself, uh, to people from nonprofit, and they're all volunteers. And I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, 11 of the original board members from eight years ago are still serving on that board. Wow. Started eight years ago then? Eight, eight years ago in January. Was there anything in particular that got this started or was it just time? No, there was a 50 million, uh, the 2006 bond program, which was over $700 million, $50 million was allocated for the revitalization of West Phoenix. So this board was, was put together to make recommendations and kind of oversee the spending of that $50 million in the revitalization efforts. Were the 50, was the $50 million meant to be spent during a certain time frame, or how, how did that work? Well, originally it was supposed to be uh, spent in six to seven years, but because of the economy and the ability for uh, the city of Phoenix to issue bonds, it's going to stretch out to probably a 10 to 14 year project. Okay, let's talk about this report now. What did the report look at? What mm -hmm. did the report find? Yes, well, it's the 2012 annual report, and we had great, uh, a lot of significant achievements and accomplishments that we wanted to share with the community. So what we found is that um, crime continues to um, decline. Um, from a property crime standpoint, it's down 33%. Um, from a violent crime standpoint, it's down 14%. Um, we also uh, were able to open up a new senior center, um, the Helen Drake uh, Senior Center off of 27th Avenue and Northern to help our seniors, and it's a green building, award-winning building. Um, we were able to also train over 500 people um, to get them ready, job readiness, um, and we worked we had over 500, or excuse me, 500,000 visitors to the libraries in the area. So we had a lot of significant achievements, and we just wanted to share that information with the community. Let's start with, with the crime that Ginger mentioned here. 33% mm -hmm. reduction in property crime, 14% reduction in violent crime. Why? What happened? Well, I think it's a combination of, of a very fine police department uh, in, in the West Phoenix area, along with the citizens groups. We have a, a ton of block watches out there. Uh, we're, we're very good at cleaning up graffiti. Uh, we've done tons of work on graffiti, so we, uh, we clean up the area, we make citizens more proud of the area, therefore they're more invested in the area and they're invested in, in keeping crime down. So with the cooperation of the police department and the citizens, it's helped to 
to reduce that. Were there particular projects involved mm -hmm. that happened as a result of the revitalization area? Yes, there was one. Um, there were several projects. There was one project, though, that was in partnership with Grand Canyon University, and they worked very closely with our police department, with our Maryville, um, Australia, Cactus Park precincts. And what they were able to do was really focus on trying to clean up um, uh, prostitution in the area. Um, they also um, worked with students and after looking at their after school activities and making sure that they're not doing things they're not supposed to. Um, so really working closely with the youth in that area and then also look at looking at panhandling. Um, one of the other things that Grand Canyon University did was they actually donated over 10 bikes um, to the police department to help out with the bike patrol in the area and they used those bikes to help with the um, after school efforts for Alhambra High School. And were these the kind of things again the board or, or the group, the organization looks at and says here's an area around Camelback or here's an area out here in Maryvale. I mean, how do you, how do you uh, send out priorities here? How do you? Well, that's exactly right. Everybody lives and works in the, in the West Phoenix area, so they know boots on the ground, so to speak. Yes. They know what's going on in their neighborhoods. They know what's going on in the area. They know what their needs are. We, we've done a lot in the area of, of safe trips for students to, uh, to the schools where sidewalks haven't been available to students. We've made sidewalks available. So there's been a ton of things that, that has come up out of the community that we were able to implement with the uh, bond dollars. And there's a neighborhood revitalization uh, program, a stabilization, I should say, program as well, mm -hmm. going into foreclosed home. I think $12 million invested mm -hmm. into foreclosed properties. Talk to us about that. Yes, the neighborhood stabilization program, with those, the $12 million that was invested in the community, we uh, were able to acquire 96 foreclosed homes. Um, we were able to rehabilitate and to sell 51 of those homes. Um, and we were able to um, sell an additional 25 foreclosed homes with additional homeowner assistance, um, home ownership, excuse me, sure. assistance program funds. And, and this money again comes from the bond money? Right, so there's several different funding sources that we use to um, invest in the West Phoenix revitalization area. So it's 2006 bond funds. We also use the neighborhood stabilization funds, which is federal funds. We use community development block grant funds. Um, and the list goes on. We even use parks and preserves initiatives to help out with some of the improvements to the parks in the area. How bad did the housing crisis hit West Phoenix? Oh, I think it's probably as bad as any other area. There yeah. was Levine and, and some other areas that were hit hard, but I think it's going to be back a lot faster. I might add what Ginger said is, as far as the, the collaboration. We, we've reached out to the business community, mainly retail shopping centers, small shopping centers, big shopping centers to help revitalize their shopping centers to to make sure that they're in concert with what we're trying to do with inside of our communities. I was going to say this the neighborhood stabilization program and I, I looked at foreclosed properties I assumed they were all residential. Were they not all residential? Were there some commercial properties? There were some commercial properties but the, obviously the majority was residential. Uh, but it was a great collaboration where we can go into businesses and say, you know, we're, we're, we're improving 67th Avenue. We're putting in streetscaping and uh, we're doing landscaping improvements and so forth. You now need to clean up your property. And we've had a very good response from the, from the uh, business community. I also noticed as well that Maryvale Golf Course was saved, and this mm -hmm. was considered a successful effort as far as the revitalization area is concerned. Uh, why was that such a big deal? Yes, basically over the last year through our innovation and efficiency efforts, one of the areas that we looked at was our golf courses um, and the revenues that we're bringing in. And so there are challenges there. And so the Parks Department, working the City Manager's Office, Mayor and Council, they actually put together a task force to look at the golf courses and to make recommendations as far as which golf courses should remain open, which ones should be closed. And so the community, Maryvale community, spoke loud and clear and just said, do not shut down our golf course. And Mr. Miller was very um, influential in that um, process. Why were you so influential? The golf course kind of has a little bit of a badge for a community, doesn't it? It's, it's an identity for an area. Oh, definitely. I work for John F. Long, and he... Uh, help uh, uh, build that golf course 50 some years ago mm -hmm. and it's always been a key to the community where affordable golf hasn't been made available to West Phoenix part of the building of that golf course it's in the center of the revitalization area it's a green area mm -hmm. uh, so other than golfing there's there's jogging and all sorts of activities going on there so to take a take a jewel away from that community uh, was not necessary, and we fought hard for it, and we're happy that the city council saw the wisdom in keeping it open. Well, I'm happy, too. I play the course a couple of times, and it's a nice <laughs> course out there. Yes, it is. Um, biggest challenge now for West Phoenix? 
What do you see looking forward? You know, for us, what we want to do is just to continue to work with the community, to work with the advisory board, with the businesses, with the schools, so that we can continue to reduce crime in the area, um, that we can continue to have economic development in the area. So we've made a lot of progress over the years, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so for us from the city's side, um, we just want to continue with our efforts. As, as far as the board is concerned here, what, what are the biggest challenges? How do you keep this momentum going? Well, like any project that goes over years and years and years, it's hard to keep you know, everybody's enthusiasm up. But it was a big challenge to start with, and we still have a lot of goals yet to meet. So I think we, we're, we're totally invested in, in continuing the bond program, finishing it out. Hopefully there will be additional bond money in the future. And when you talk about revitalization of a, a community that's well over 50 years old, you just don't do it overnight. And if you don't continue to improve upon the revitalization, then you take a step backwards, and we definitely don't want to see that. So uh, I think our hearts and souls are in keeping the program moving forward well after the 2006 uh, bond money runs out. And real quickly, are you seeing that commitment from citizens? Are they starting to figure this out? Oh, yes, definitely. And, and, we're, and we're recruiting more people into the movement. So it, it's, it's gratifying. I, I want to compliment the city staff, too. They've gone over and above their their normal day's work to help support the revitalization effort. They, they've just been key to all of this. And last question for you. Is yes. the city going to continue this kind of, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, let's get the push. Well, the push, you don't want the push to end. So what's, what's happening here? Yes, definitely. We are committed. Our um, council members have spoken very loudly. We've got, um, this area is represented by four different council yeah. members. <laughs> Councilwoman Williams, um, Councilman Nowakowski, Councilman Valenzuela, and Councilman Simplot. And then our city manager, mayor, rest of council. We are totally committed. All right. Good to have you both here. Thanks well, for thank joining you. us. Okay. Enjoyed thank it. you. Arizona Commerce Authority is charged with recruiting, creating, and growing business. But how does the Commerce Authority drive jobs and business to Arizona, and how successful have those efforts been? Joining me to talk about recent business developments in the state is Greg Linneman, Chief Operating Officer for the Arizona Commerce Authority. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ted. Great to be here. What exactly is the Arizona? We've had we've talked about that quite a bit on the show, but but remind us of what we're talking about. Sure, sure. Briefly, we're the state of Arizona's economic development organization. We were created by the legislature and the governor in 2011 uh, to drive Arizona's economy uh, economy forward, particularly by pursuing high quality jobs. Has the uh, has the ACA evolved since its inception? Absolutely. Um, you know, our first year was sort of a foundational year as with any organization we developed policies and we helped acclimate our board and uh, we got our bearings uh, so maybe a good part of the first year was about the transition and the foundation this year has been full speed ahead we've been working very hard and had a lot of great results let's talk about uh, how the ACA actually drives jobs and business to Arizona absolutely we, we generally speaking pursue three strategies job creation through three strategies number one is business creation 
where we work with companies that are early stage and we help them uh, get a foothold and commercialize. Uh, number two is business expansion, uh, which means working with existing Arizona companies of all sizes to help them grow. And then number three is business attraction, which essentially means recruiting other businesses from out of state and internationally to Arizona. Is there a focus on high wage jobs here? Absolutely. Across the board, our focus is always on high wage jobs. Interesting. All right, let's talk about some of the expansions here. GoDaddy, 300 jobs here. How much was the ACA involved? Uh, extensively uh, in terms of delivering services and helping with site selection, helping them understand Arizona opportunity, projecting labor, uh, workforce opportunities, and delivering uh, incentives. Arizona uh, Commerce Authority was involved from the get-go with GoDaddy. And OGM had an expansion here as well, a thousand some odd jobs. Same kind of thing as far as what the Commerce Authority did and was involved with? Absolutely. We worked with General Motors for a long period of time. They went through a, a long internal process. They're a very large uh, company, uh, as obviously you understand, so they're their uh, timeline was, was longer than some of our other companies, which are more nimble. Um, but we advised them all along the way about the advantages of Arizona, and, and we we're very excited. Obviously, they ultimately chose Arizona and Chandler in particular. Talk about the dynamics, though, between a GM, where you may need to remind them what Arizona is all about, and a GoDaddy, who should know very well what Arizona is all about. Absolutely. That gets right to the difference between the attraction and the expansion uh, strategies. The, the attraction is all about educating folks. Uh, about Arizona in terms of what Arizona offers uh, their business as well as helping them understand the specific uh, incentives and other programs that we can deliver to help them help their company take root. Would these expansions though not have happened if ACA did not exist? I mean talk to us about because we've had critics on the program saying that the Commerce Authority nice idea but the marketplace this would have happened anyway. Sure well, well two responses to that number one every state in the nation is doing what we're doing. So if we decide not to do it, obviously we're at a huge competitive disadvantage because there's lots of other, all the other states are out there uh, competing for these opportunities. Number two, we talk to these companies and we ask them, are we delivering value? And we hear um, you know, in every case that absolutely they're making decisions on the basis of what we're telling them and the services that the state is delivering to how them. How do you make sure you don't deliver too much value? I mean, how do you make sure that uh, the Arizona's residents get what uh sometimes they're paying for. Absolutely. Well, we have, uh, we have a very sophisticated evaluation process for our discretionary programs in terms of comparing the return to the uh, state in terms of tax revenue versus um, the incentives they might receive. A lot of that analysis, though, too, I should point out, is done very capably and astutely by the legislature when they developed the statutory programs in the first case. Are, are, there, I mean, are there algorithms? Are there ways to <laughs> look at these metrics to say, you know, uh, Ted's Hamburger Hamlet wants just a little bit too much here as, sure. far, as far as our, our equations go. How do you make sure that you don't give up too much? Absolutely. And I don't know if they, they constitute algorithm, algorithms per se, but there's two types of economic uh, modeling that you can do, industry accepted uh, standards, and I won't get too far into the weeds, but one is REMI and the other is IMPLAN, and these are sophisticated models developed by economists, improved over the years. You can plug project parameters into those models and they will give you projections about indirect jobs created, economic activity generated, and most pertinently probably to your question, state tax revenue that can be projected because you're able to gen compare the state tax revenue projections to the incentives. How much uh, does fe do, do federal grants, how much, I know there's a manufacturing aspect what the ACA does and the federal Absolutely. grant is involved there. How much federal money is flowing through this particular project? Uh, through the manufacturing extension it's program in particular, it's a $5 million grant, uh, $1, $1 million per year for five years. Extremely excited about it. It's a new prog program to help Arizona small and mid-sized manufacturers. We're going to be able to deploy our resources combined with the federal resources to help small and mid-sized manufacturers compete. Uh, globally by helping them do what they already do better. And I know the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration has a grant as well as part of what the ACA does? Absolutely. This is another small, small business targeted program. It's a uh, loan participation program where we're able to uh, provide loans in conjunction with either private equity funding in small businesses uh, or private financing uh, small businesses, obviously leveraging existing financing opportunities. A couple of questions, again, uh, from folks we've had on the program who aren't enamored with the ACA. Sure. They say that the Commerce Authority essentially by offering incentives or even focusing assistance is picking favorites. How do you respond to that? Sure. Well, I can tell you that when it comes to trying to help facilitate high quality job creation, we are equal opportunity across the board. We will uh, try to provide our assistance, whether it's financial or services in kind, uh, to any kind of employer that's helping create high quality jobs. And from that, the wonderful thing about high quality jobs is that, again, this gets back to some of the modeling we're talking about, 
the multiplier effect of the high quality jobs in terms of the indirect jobs that they create and the economic activity that they create and the tax revenue that they create, they help create all the other kinds of jobs that we might not be able to because the limited staff and resources help directly as often. But again, back to Ted's hamburger hamlet here. Sure. Uh, how do you explain to the small business guy or the, the person who's been here for a while and is struggling, all of a sudden they're seeing incentives, they're seeing assistance, how do you explain that this is fair and up and up? Absolutely. Well, the first thing I'd point out is that the Arizona legislature is mindful of the hamburger shack. Absolutely. For example, the Arizona legislature has um, reduced corporate tax rates some 60 percent over a five-year uh, five timeline. So absolutely, small businesses are targeted as well. But the other thing I'd point out is that when we go out and attract the high-quality job, the bigger employees, those folks are eating at the hamburger shack. Again, that has to do with the multiplier effect. We think everyone benefits from the high-quality jobs. So when, when critics say too much government interference here from the Commerce Authority, you say? We are a public-private partnership in nature. Our board consists of 17 private sector CEOs. We are engaged with the business community. We are not strictly a government entity. We are to help connect the dots of the economy so that everyone benefits. Before you go real quickly, I've got to ask about State Farm in Tempe. That is a humongous project down by the lake. How much was ACA involved? Uh, very involved uh, from very early on. Very exciting project. Largest office development in the history of Arizona. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that one. I guess we can't Absolutely. avoid that one. Uh, good to have you here. Thanks hey, for joining us. Thanks for having me. And Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalist Roundtable. The House finally starts moving on a budget and Medicaid expansion, but whose budget ideas will move and how far will they go? Those stories and more Friday on the Journalist's Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.